like us to make sure that we have the appeal section in here, which we have in the code, but we don't actually have an article um, in this section. So we have it a little bit further in a different section in Article 13, but they want it in the HPC Historic Preservation section as well. So if anybody chooses to, if anybody gets denied by the Historic Preservation Commission, um, we've always informed them that their route to appeal is to the mayor and council. Um, so the state would like us to have that language in there. So we have this, um, we have this in the other portion in the, in the Article 13, so we've just used the same language and moved it over to here as well so that we can satisfy the state. So, but we currently send them any, um, a written notice if they are denied, we send them a notice as to why, and uh, we also include in that you have 30 days um, if you choose to do so to appeal. Um, so we, we do all of it now. The state just wants the language written in the document in the code. So that's what this text amendment is for. Is there any questions for Ms. Dibble? Councilmember Wilsey. Thank you, Jackie, um, for going through all this. Um, quick question, so just to clarify, if in maintenance an item, say a window, is replaced, but it's a different material, it has to come before That HPC. has to go to the HPC. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. So if you have a window, and you know, they just put in like four years ago and you're getting it got broken and you got the exact same window, right. it's ordinary maintenance. If it's wood, it's fine. Wood, if mm -hmm. it's vinyl or aluminum, it's yep. got to Whatever it might have been. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then another question. Is there any communication that goes out on a regular basis to, to uh, I guess, homeowners, business owners, property owners in the historic district just to let them know of this? Um, There's not currently, no. um, other than just having the requirements are posted on our website. Okay. Um, and uh, they reach out to us on a regular basis asking. Um, there are occasions where they're in the historic district and they don't reach out and then start doing work and we have to we catch them. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, we are actually, as a department, working on putting together um, some info type, whether it's webinars or some sure. videos working community relations on, and that's actually one of the topics um, that we've got, um, we're talking about. Um, it's just going to take us some time because we have a number of hot topics right now sure, that sure. we want to make sure that we educate people okay. on. Um, but there is um, good information that's out there now, okay. um, and and most people do know and um, you know give it. They call Julie all the time or call us, and right, right. we're able to give them the right direction. Okay. And I just if, if there's any sort of proactive just communication, just to kind of let them know that they're in a special place and that there are special rules that apply. Yeah, um, I think that would be helpful. So. But I like the idea of the webinars and just getting people together. Yeah, so we're going to work on that. And one of them is basically, you live in the historic district, so what does that mean? Right, you right, know, perfect. Like that. so, yeah. That's what we're looking at. So hopefully by fall, um, we're looking at getting some of those put together and ready to go. Okay, awesome, cool. thanks. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Dock? Do I have a motion for this text amendment? Motion to approve. A motion to approve by Councilmember Tyser. Do I have a second? Second by Councilmember Hall. Any other questions? All in favor of the motion to approve, raise your hand. And that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Item number three is a text amendment to the Unified Development Code on construction phasing for a mixed-use development and a policy to set the standards. Ms. Dibel. Okay, so um, you all worked with the Planning Commission um, related to the mixed-use development and the construction phasing. So, and then last month at committee, Allison Vrolick from Planning Commission made the presentation. So what we've done is actually write out the section for the text amendment and then we've created a policy. It's the first time. Um, so I don't know if it's going to be what you're looking for, but um, that's what we're here for to show changes. So we have, we're putting this in section 13.3.3 application requirements. So we are creating a number three. So um, right now, that section is basically stating the different application requirements um, for what you need to submit. So we are asking that in order for people to submit, I didn't change this, okay, the code. So in a quarter, for if, like, if mixed use development comes in, um, they are going to have to provide a construction phasing, basically policy or um, plan for staff. So this is the language that went that you saw and heard from the Planning Commission. We didn't change any of the wording. Um, it seemed like everybody liked this at the committee meeting last month. So this is what we've got as proposed language 
for Article 13 um, to go through and to be added in. And this will go through the text amendment portion. This, um, this one is different than the policy. So this one has to go through the entire process of being initiated for a text amendment, and then we'll go to planning commission, and then on to council <coughs> for the two readings. The second half of this is a policy, and based on the stuff that Lenore and I found, um, that's set by resolution, um, and I think can, I don't really know all the rules, can come straight to council and be approved um, by resolution. We so, want them to go in parallel so that they yeah. stay together for you guys as best we can. To the end. <laughs> so we created this for the policy standards. So we have the intent, which is the wording that they had at the beginning portion of um, the language. Um, and this would be the beginning part of this. And then we set up, um, if you got the paperwork I have in here, it kind of shows you what we're looking for is creating the resolution. I think that's all in your packet there. Relate to the intent statement. And then I called it procedures. Not exactly sure if that's the wording we want to use. Um, I got that off of a couple of the other ones we've had that I was looking at. But these are the exact, um, this is all the exact language that you heard from Allison last month. So I didn't know if any of this wanted to change or if this was going to stay the same. And then, like Lenore just said, we're going to run these in tandem. So once we um, get the first half of it um, started and go through the process, we would bring this portion through probably by the time it gets to the first reading for council. Because this part won't go to planning commission. Right. And, and just as a reminder, the code is more general so that the policy, which can be changed more easily with the percentages where you've got all of those details, um, was the approach that uh, planning commission recommended and, and was presented to you guys. So then we have this on to this. So, um, and that's what we have for this section. I didn't know um, if anybody would. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Any questions on, on this policy, Councilmember Palermo? There it is. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so appreciate the work that staff put into this and, and, and really especially Planning Commission as we had discussed at that, that meeting when we met with the Planning Commission. I was, I was really impressed that they, they, uh, they really had put a lot more effort and, uh, and really had a lot more progress than I had, had anticipated and, uh, and, and really, I, I think, thought it out really well. So I'm, I'm good with the one through five. Frankly, as, as I think everyone knows, I'd, I'd prefer to be a, a, for it to be a little stricter uh, or, or a good amount stricter. But I, I think given the, the effort and the discussion that Planning Commission had, um, I, I think I can get comfortable with one through five. So my... My updates are actually not on one through five, but more on the zoning categories that it affects. So actually, a resident reached out to me um, that, that lives on the east side and, and, uh, and really brought up great, a great point. Just, just ultimately, you know, us being individuals that focus so much on our zoning code, we think of our exact definitions of mixed use. So for example, we think of CX, commercial mixed use. But at the end of the day, mixed use is really when you have the mix of mixes of uses. And so, so it's brought up potentially you end up having mixed use developments occurring in CC, CH, and, and even potentially PV. And so that's where, that's where the, the resident had brought up the, uh, the need or the understanding that, that shouldn't those be covered as well, in which case I thought was a was an absolutely great point because because a resident they're not focused on oh is it a is it a CX or a uh, or an NX zoning what they're focused on what's it actually going to be and if they end up coming out in support of of a large mixed use project on C, uh, on CC or CH their expectation is all of it's going to get built and uh, and and they wouldn't want us to run into this issue. That we've that we've had we've this is this is obviously to fix an, an issue where where a developer you know promised this this whole plan and only built part of it and that was in CX and I like that we're addressing CX but I think we really need to be proactive and uh, and really include this in, in CC CH PV I, I'd, I'd be open to staff or or this uh, this committee if there's any other zoning uh, districts that it that it should be added and again as the reminder. Council always has the ability to reduce or waive, or waive those. I think it is really important that in any hearing, council always has that ability, which which is covered under this uh, under this update. I just want to make sure that we're we're starting out starting out on the right foot. Right. Thank you. Is there other comments or questions? Councilmember Zapata. 
Thank you, Michael. So, um, we also would like to hear um, for CCCHPV to add in here uh, why, well, Councilor Palermo exp expressed why yes, but I would like to know if there's any why not to include that. I would like to hear as well. Uh, and also, um, what does it mean on the last sentence, certain project milestone and or build out? Is these certain projects, miles, milestones, very clear for everybody, or we need to spell out the certain project milestones? So I, be I believe that's what this portion is for, okay. so that you'll get the, like, look at number, so number three. Um, the project has to have, permits won't be issued for any residential. Um, you could get 51 to 79% for residential, as long as at least 25% of the non-residential has been CO'd. So, and then if you go up to number four, you'll see that you can get the last portion of the residential square footage building permits as long as at least 80% of the non-residential has been CO'd. So I believe those are the project milestones that they're re we're referencing here in this section right here at the end. Right, so it's clear for everybody that we're referring to this one, two, yes. three, four so points. It's clear, yeah. no, miss different interpretation of certain project milestones is clear as a stone. Yep. Write it, written on a stone. Yep. A stone. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. That's an advertiser. Thank you. Ms. Dybul, can you remind me, in the last four years, have any mixed-use projects been done in the city of Roswell, completed or started? So not just approved, but completed? That's right. Have they been, have they been done? was the last one that was finally built out and finished in 17, I think, right. when it was finished. And technically, the townhomes with the uh, custard place in front of it is mixed use. Which one's the custard <laughs> place in front of it? For the custard, uh, the old blacksmith. Oh, the old blacksmith one. Okay. Technically, that um, Yeah, that's sort of mixed use, yeah. Other than that, no. Yeah. Also, um, on the corner next uh, behind Sprouts, townhomes and commercial. On the, on the, the corner dance of studio. Oh, yeah. That's, that's corner the corner of house and house They came through together. That would be the but probably was, most recent one. Yeah. I think they technically split themselves up oh, yeah. before they did. But yeah. Okay, my bad. Yep. It was splitting hairs. Kind of tandem. So, so <laughs> kind of tandem. They're, they're, yeah. So the answer was? Not very many. Not very many. No? <laughs> I would say not many. Uh, not many or none? I would say... I have to look at the dates because you asked for four years, to be honest with you. But. Okay. If you, could, if you could get back, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on this item? Do I have a motion for item number three? So motion, motion to move forward to council with the addition of CC, CH, and PV. So I have a motion to move forward with the addition of CC, CH, and PV. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Hall. Any other questions? All in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And that is Council Member Hall, Palermo, Wilsey, Judy, and Zapata. All opposed? Raise your hand. That's Mayor Henry and Council Member Tyser. So it passes. To move forward to Council. More. Item number four is consideration of an initiation of a text amendment to the Unified Development Code. Sections 2.2.2, lot 2.2.8, building setbacks, 2.2.19, residential garage parking, 2.2.20, residential parking location, 3.29, townhouses, 4.35, townhouses, 5.37, townhouses, 6.32, townhouses, and 14.2, defined terms. So that is now read into the record, <laughs> and I'll turn that over to Ms. Bromberg. Thank you. And I, I, there's a lot that we're going to cover today. I will do my best to go through this as methodically um, and as um, carefully as we can to make sure that um, we can all follow along. Um, the uh, packet that you were provided um, that was published online um, had a, 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 the border that goes along the side of it did cover some things, so you should have also gotten a clean copy of the track changes um, that includes my comments along the way. 
um, in case you have um, a, a, a trouble reading the one that's in the packet. Uh, just as quick background, um, this was originally asked uh, staff to bring this to the April 28th committee. Um, we had a lot of discussion um, as a part of that. It was referred to the May 26th committee, um, and staff was requested to include in their review of the text, um, uh, in, in addition to just putting the definitions in the same location, which was our original charge, um, to look at um, all of the things related to lots frontage, look at flexibility for the townhouse definition of front, um, as well as looking at uh, driveway length. Um, just due to the, the number of things that were on the May 26th committee, we asked to defer to today. So that's why we're here today. So getting straight into it, the first section we're going to look at is 2.2.2 lot. Um, this is where the uh, lot is defined. Um, the first thing to look at is lot frontage. Um, so today it reads, every lot must have frontage upon a public street, private street, built to public standards, or specified cottage or courtyard for cottage court. Um, due to the request for looking at some flexibility, we've taken a look, and the city of Alpharetta actually includes additional language which says, or a civic space usable for civic purposes, um, including not limited to park, square, plaza, pocket park, playground, common area, or open space. Um, this is a slightly different list of words than what they had. They have some words that you don't find in our code, and then they also didn't use a common area or open space, which are two uh, specific measurements that our code includes that we felt it made better sense to refer to those. So this is one of those areas that can allow us some flexibility. Um, I'm going to continue through this section, and then we can talk about this slide um, it, it, before we move on to the next section, just to keep um, ourselves straight. Front property line, this has been moved from Article 14 to this location so that it is all grouped together. Uh, the front property parcel or site boundary line coincident with a public or private street right-of-way line, specified courtyard for cottage court, or a civic space usable for civic purposes, including not limited to park, square, plaza, pocket park, playground, common area, or open space. So this then provides that same flexibility. And where there's a lot of confusion in between these two is frontage means you have to have a line contiguous with something. Um, the property line front is defined specifically to establish which setbacks are measured from where. Um, and so that's why that is important um, for us to have some clarification on. The next is rear property line. Again, just moving this to this location. And the rear property line is the property line opposite to the front property line. Uh, and then corner lot, a lot of budding upon two or more streets at their intersection is a corner lot. This is important when we start looking at the, there are some side street setbacks that are different from an interior lot setback. So when we get to setbacks, you'll see that again. So I'm going to stop there for just a second and see if there's any questions or concerns or comments on this section to begin with. Anything for 2.2.2? .2 All right, 2.2.8. Yes. So building setbacks, again, <coughs> uh, moving the definition to here, so defined a line demarcating the required distance between a property line and the face of building structure, accessory structure. So no changes to that, just putting it in this location. And then um, when setbacks were created within our code, we refer to primary street and then side interior, rear. And so the primary street, of course, becomes an issue if we're going to allow the flexibility for the front door to face a public open space. Um, so this is a recommendation to change those definitions to be front side, rear, and then we do all have side street um, because if it's on a corner, you would have a different number that's measured from that side street. Are there any questions about the building setbacks on this section? We're going to go to some more. <laughs> I don't see anything. Let's right. go to two points. So the continuing on with the setbacks, um, there's a little bit more going on here, but again, it's to clean up and match those definitions that we've just established in the last two slides. Uh, the first is that instead of referring to primary street, we would refer to a front setback. It's going to be measured from the front property line, as defined in the previous slides. Um, the rear setback is measured at a right angle from the rear property line or the rear right-of-way or access easement where there is a secondary roadway or driveway. Um, this is to allow for the situation where you have a townhome that is facing a road or the public space, whatever we decide that that's going to be, and is rear-loaded with a secondary road or a, a driveway. Um, there are some circumstances where... Uh, you may have um, an access easement that is the separating those rear units um, and the driveways are off of that um, as opposed to it being um, a full street. And so we wanted to make sure that we provided that opportunity. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to pull up the plot up to, to define this for sure, but Harlow is a good example 
Um, their units face a street, and then they have done private access drives on the rear side, and their, and their driveways are off of that. But that is not public right-of-way. It's an um, access easement that those properties share across that. So that's kind of a, an example of where you might see that. <clears throat> on corner lots, the side street setback is measured a right angle from the side street right-of-way line. And then, um, again, just replacing primary street with front property line, rear property line, or side, uh, in this case, um, in order to define all those lots. Um, this is really to get the fact that you've got um, side interior lot lines are every, is everything else. And so there's a different setback measurement that's associated with that. And then this next one is just a, clear, a correction. Um, we've always, um, this has landscape buffer, and we actually don't have a definition of landscape buffer within EDC. It's neighborhood compatibility buffer. So this is just a typo. Um, that we read when we were going through this and wanted to make sure that we corrected that. I can, I've got some more setback stuff we're going to go to unless anybody has any questions on this particular slide. All right, so next we've got, did it switch? Is it? Okay. Nope. Oh, I don't, that is it. So on this is just the correction of the letters There's the, because of the reordering of everything. All right, so now we're into residential garage parking. Um, this is broken up into um, elements for single family and then for townhouse. We're just specifically talking about townhouse. Um, so for townhouses, today it reads, for townhouses, garage placement must meet the following standards. Townhouses fronting a major street must be reloaded, and there is a definition of major street within the UDC. Townhouses fronting a minor street may be reloaded or front-loaded, and townhouses fronting a civic space usable for civic purposes may be reloaded. And this again allows for the opportunity for them to have a front facing that public space um, with the driveways off of the back. Highlighted. And then um, garage doors must face the rear access. Oh, sorry, this is for rear loaded. This is broken into rear loaded and then front loaded. So specific to rear loaded. Uh, garage doors would face the rear access right-of-way or access easement. This is, again, to allow for whether it is an actual roadway right-of-way or an access easement. Um, and then this is one thing that we did spend quite a bit of time talking about with some concerns being raised regarding the distances. So for rear loaded, the garage doors must be located either four feet from the rear property line or access easement or be a minimum of 20 feet from that same rear property line or access easement. Um, the, the option here basically is, is an option that we've included in the code already, which is either has to be so short you cannot park in it or it has to be long enough that you can park in it. Um, I know one of the concerns raised about this um, in our previous conversations is, you know, how do we regulate this? If someone fills up their garage and they've only got that short distance, but they still try to park there, you know, how do we manage that? Um, it is an enforcement issue um, because you're creating a public safety issue or an access issue for other people, so it may be something that's um, an HOA requirement. It's something that if we get a complaint, we certainly would go out and deal with it. Um, this does offer some flexibility so that you can have those smaller spaces on the rear side of things um, and still have the bigger spaces out front. Um, we felt that leaving that option of 4 or 20 made sense. If you were to make everything 20, it essentially means that you have to have a front and a rear setback of 20 in just about every place. So it starts to create a lot of limitations on lot layout. Um, uh, it, it may be something that we not we don't want to, to have. So I'm going to stop there because I know that was a point of conversation before to see if anybody has any questions. Any questions? Councilmember Tyser. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you getting the, the four foot uh, into there. That I refer to that as an apron. Uh, that's the apron that the Plan, Thank you. I think if there's there's something we, we've learned, you know, of, of course a developer is going to want to build as many townhomes as they can and on, on as, as little space as possible, and I, I completely understand that. It's, it's important for us to have guidelines that are really making for the best 
best experience for those residents that are going to move into those townhomes, as well as as well as all the neighbors as well. And and my my issue with the enforcement issue is, it's as as staff mentioned, it's very difficult to enforce. And what ends up happening is if we're going to encourage, I think what we need to focus on, this is not about townhomes that have been built in the past, but going forward, what is it that we want our zoning code to look like? And, and frankly, the, um, you know, the quality of the products that, that are built. And the issue is if we're going to allow where a car can't even fit, you know, uh, with, you know, in, in a four foot, a four foot space, then they're either going to be parking there, you know, still with, with a big part of the car sticking out and creating a safety issue, or they're going to be parking just, you know, on the streets, parking other areas and public areas, et cetera. And of course, we can just argue, well, then if that's the case, they're breaking the rules and we can just have code enforcement go. It's not that simple because the average person, when they're buying a, uh, when they're buying a home, or, you know, they're not they're not thinking and bringing out a tape measure. Or am I going to have challenges with the cars, et cetera? They're looking at the the kitchen, the bathroom, the the location, and ultimately, if if we're allowing new new townhomes to be developed that are not that are not quality uh, products and, and and don't don't think about something important like frankly, you know, needing uh, needing a, a car or a second car, et, et cetera, then then even the resident that's living in that townhome is going to, I feel, be very frustrated with the city and therefore frustrated with all the elected officials for having created a code that, that created that opportunity, in which case they're going to be angry if they're getting tickets, they're going to be angry at us, the people that are <coughs> reporting the complaints are going to be angry it's going on. So I, I just feel it's not setting us up for success. Thank you, Councilmember Member Hall. Uh, Council Member Tizer, I did uh, drive several townhouse projects as well a couple of weeks ago with my tape measure and there are quite a few that have the 20 feet and uh, in some cases that's not even enough with the size of vehicles that people have currently with the larger trucks I have I'll, I'm happy to share that with you as soon as I can find it after the meeting that's over Judy <coughs> um, this just goes to my and we'll see multiple things today. Um, we had some people say that the code was near perfect a few meetings ago in a council meeting, and <clears throat> here we are again trying to fix the UDC with little things as this that could have unintended consequences. And <clears throat> I am, <clears throat> I, I agree. I think we need to look real hard at this four feet apron and the twenty foot number. Um, in the sidewalk issue um, and some other things on this uh, today and before we pass it. Um, again, I, I, it, it, we're looking at, let's see, how many issues doing with the UDC today? Again, I, I just think at some point we got to go back and look at the whole UDC and, and, and figure out if we just need to redo the whole thing and, and what, what we're doing is, is obviously not working because this is constant and I can guarantee you, you go to other cities there aren't this number of changes to a UDC on every single committee meeting so that's my point thank you Councilor Bertizer thank you uh, just a question for um, either either Lenora or Jackie um, are there any other communities uh, that uh, have the apron option uh, with townhomes and I believe that's uh, the rear uh, on, on this. Um, are there any other communities that have that? And um, uh, do we know of any uh, of the kinds of problems that were just described, or are those just imagined um, uh, kinds of problems? I mean, do, uh, take Alpharetta, for example. We seem to like their code quite a bit. Um, do they have that? To be honest with you, I don't remember. Um, we have looked at a lot of them, and I just don't recall if they had a similar 4 and 20. We can certainly look into that. And just to be clear, this is not from the edge of the road. This is from the property line. So if there is no sidewalk, um, it's still the right-of-way line, and that space that's there is, is there in addition to the 4 feet, which honestly is what creates the conflicts that you would run into is, is that it's not this. And that's because you have to have maneuverability. Um, I mean, I watched somebody sitting outside the other day who had – um, probably about a 12-foot-wide driveway that went along a unit, and the way that they had to go like this to 
back into their own garage as a well. That's clearly not what we want to have because they're blocking that access and it, it happened to be a dead end private. So it was a little bit easier for them to manage that. But I think that that's something that we're looking at that human user and how do we create something that council is in our residents are happy with the look at the end. Um, and, and having something that is too close um, may not be ideal, but something that is too far away um, creates a completely different feel that may not also not be what we want to do. Um, the, there is um, a requirement that whatever the number is that's used, that there has to be sufficient room that they don't block a sidewalk. So if the sidewalk's not there, clearly it becomes a, a non-issue. So it, it is, there's, I don't think there is any one right answer. I don't, you know, unless we want to make it so that every single um, garage has to be a minimum of 20 feet from the property line for everything so that everybody has to have that required parking on um, those rear loaded. That would be the only solution. And as Councilmember Hall says, you still have people who can't park or they get these massive vehicles that, that, that are going to stick out into that space and they're, you know, there reaches a point where there's not something that we can necessarily put in the code to cover that. It, it, it is an enforcement issue. Um, I don't believe, you know, other than a couple of um, locations that we know have a common problem with, with not necessarily following the rules. I don't think it's something that is a rampant problem because our residents are really good about telling us when people aren't parking properly. Um, we, they're the kind of calls that we get all the time. So I, I feel confident that we can come up with something that will be manageable from an enforcement perspective and then also give the look and feel that y'all want for townhomes. Yeah, I'd just like, to, just like to add, I live in such a neighborhood and there are fine, outstanding citizens of Roswell who live there. <laughs> Council members of Potter. Thank you. So, um, well, a couple of things. You know, I, I appreciate and uh, I'm not opposed to discuss and debate and find uh, improvements to specific items of the UDC. Uh, I think that this is our job. So I'm not opposed to bring forward, debate, discuss, improve specific areas of the UDC. Um, so back to the townhouse. So if I understand correctly, the four feet that we're talking about is to pull the car into the garage, in and out of the garage? So this would be, you'd have your edge of your road. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the circumstances, you may or may not have a grass strip and then sidewalk and then your property line. And this would be four feet from that. And so that total, let's assume that there's a five-foot sidewalk and a two-foot grass strip for this conversation. So you have the seven plus one is eight plus four is 12. And 12 is not long enough to be able to park a car in without sticking into the road. Mm -hmm. And that means that they would have to be pulling into their garage, which would be at that four feet by code. Um, the um, alternative would be that number instead of four would be 20. So you'd have that additional um, 16 feet, <laughs> doing backwards math, in order to have that, that space to be there. Now, if there is no sidewalk, the, the right-of-way isn't necessarily that much closer to the road. Um, there are occasions when uh, transportation may reduce that typical section because no sidewalks are there, um, and we've got those typical sections in the code that allow that to be a little bit shorter. So in that case, let's say that it's only a few feet from the road to that property line, then you've got that much shorter distance if you have four. So it just it compresses it even more. Is that so, so the main street will be right next to the four there on the graph? It's not the back of the property, it's the front of the property. So this is back. This is only talking about the rear. So this okay. would only be if there's a rear access on the back of the building. Front is different, um, and I'll have so that next. the back next. of the, the property is the garage. Correct. In okay. this picture, so they they're showing it. to maneuver a car to pull in and out of the garage? Four plus whatever space between the right-of-way line and the road. So it, it should be. But if he's there, sorry. Yes. The back of the property is not a road. There could be. So, okay. well, there has to be. There has to be some sort of access. Yeah. So either there's a driveway there or there's a road, one of the two. So it's possible that you would have an access easement with a driveway there and they would have four feet to, to pull into their. That absolutely is a scenario that could happen if that were a driveway as opposed to a road on the backside. Okay. And this would be an issue to maneuver on a four feet, a big. Yes, if they have a really big vehicle, yes, it would be potentially a challenge, but... Um, this is a smart car that is easy, but <laughs> I don't see many on the street, so... Yeah. Would be, okay. And then the garage must either be located either for... 
could be a minimum of four or have to be four? Could be a minimum of four? We would not want to do anything less than four, I think, because of the point you just made about maneuverability. So I have to say minimum of four feet. So it's either four or a minimum of 20. Okay. So it's that's, a set number or 20 or greater. Must either must. Must is. Mm -hmm. Must be. Yes, so sir. So if you use must, I think you should use minimum four feet because if must four feet is but like, the, okay, you have yes, to Yes, but the feet. reason I don't want to do that is I don't want five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I only want four or 20 or greater. So you don't want to, that's why we don't do minimum there for exactly that reason. Okay. Unless you want them to have a range. I mean, that. <laughs> Mayor Henry, did you have a comment? Um, I'd like to give a little personal history on this issue. And this came up for me probably more than 15 years ago. And it was a project that was built on Minhinet called Tower Park Place. It was an Ann Reddick project. And um, they, these were individual homes. They were townhomes. They were individual homes with one car garages and uh, driveways that I don't remember the length of the driveway, but clearly the driveways would not um, allow for a car to be parked there. So what happened after these were built, because as you know, you know, you're moving into a new home and you're thinking, okay, well, we're fine. You know, yeah, we've got two cars and a one-car garage, you know, whatever. I don't think we see too much of that anymore. But you're thinking, I, you know, I'm not going to fill my garage up with boxes and, and crap. I'm, I'm going to park my car in it. Um, but what happened in this project was because it was so constrained, private roads that were narrow, that didn't accommodate parallel parking on them, driveways that were too short to park a vehicle, um, one car garages. So what happened? They started, and they still do, they park on the lawn of the church next door because they cannot park their vehicles at their residence. So um, fast forward to what's going on today. I'm watching this happen to me next door. Um, we just, we, just built townhomes next door to me that have four foot driveways, two car garages, and guess what? Those people that thought they'd never fill up their garage with crap, they filled up their garage with stuff, I'll say. Um, and they cannot park their cars in their garages. So now what they're doing is they're parking their cars um, on their four foot driveway. The cars are hanging out. They're also blocking all of the private internal streets by parallel parking I don't I don't know from a safety issue whether that's a good thing or not um, but what we're doing what I'm concerned about is our code is creating an issue that's what I'm concerned about and when you move into a new home you're thinking that you know everything's going to be perfect and and you know this garage is going to work for us um, I've got one neighbor in the townhomes next door to me that they've got three cars. What do you do then? So, and, and the visitor parking is, doesn't really accommodate everything that they need to do. And it's not in close proximity because, frankly, um, and I'll admit to it, other than now, you know, getting my exercise, um, I tend to be lazy. I want to park as close as I can to my home. Um, so, I just want to make sure that the code that we create, the code that we allow people to build to, isn't creating an issue. I realize we've got an enforcement issue after, after the fact, but um, it's not creating an issue. And then Councilmember Tizer, I would like to say to you, you've got well over a 20-foot driveway. I've been to your home. So, you've got a shared driveway. Um, but that's well over a 20 foot driveway that comes off of the road. So there is opportunity to be parking. You're going to have to work with your neighbors on it, but you are not forced to park in a narrow street in front of your home because of the city code. So Councilmember Tyson, and then I'll go, then Councilmember Hall. So I'm referring to the neighborhood which I am a part of which has plenty of those. Um, 
And as for, I mean, it sounds like what we really have here is a problem of people putting too much stuff in their garages. <laughs> and so I don't know how you legislate that, okay? But what we're talking about here is only the rear. Is that correct? Right now, that is All correct. Right. So we're not talking about messes in the front and sidewalk issues and things like that. We're talking about a rear entry garage. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, there still has to be approval of site plans and things like that when it comes forward to us. And so that's when we would be able to comment on how it, how it might look. Um, I, I, still don't, I still don't think, I, I still, I, I, again, we can imagine all the problems in the world. We can see a few here or there. But, um, you know, again, the neighborhood that I live in and, and next to and the, and the groups that are there, uh, it seems to work fine. And, again, uh, you know, a great group of citizens that have moved here to Roswell. Councilmember Hall. <coughs> Thank you. And um, this, this doesn't even address some of the other issues that have come up in, in our meetings um, with Lenore and Jackie and, and residents and uh, legal. Uh, there was one thing that perhaps we should consider that staff had recommended is perhaps looking at a moratorium, a short-term moratorium on townhouses for 90 days to address all of these issues, um, take some time to address all of them, and that was something that was brought up. If you want to comment on that. Um, so right now, any townhome building that was submitted to us, regardless of whether it's something that comes to rezoning or it's allowed by right, um, there are a handful of variances that they would have to request that would go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Those are not variances that would come to council at this point. Um, so any project right now that is in the works or comes in in the meantime would have that option to go to BZA to get those variances to the several things that we're talking about today. Um, uh, and then if it were a rezoning, of course, it would be coming to council. So it is something that as we're working through what this might look like, um, a 90-day moratorium on, on approval of townhome projects, which would be regardless of how they're coming in, um, is something that this council could consider. Councilmember Wilson. And again, I'd have to go look and see what other jurisdictions have for their driveways. Um, my recollection is, is that most people have a very short or a long version. I just don't remember what those numbers are. I don't think that what we have is uncommon. I don't think we just pulled it out of the air. I'm sure we got it from, from someone else. But we can certainly go look at that and see what options other people provide, or if they provide no option. If they say that anything rear loaded has to be 20 feet long, period, end of story, um, then that would be the case. So just to... It jumps ahead a little bit, but when you get to the setbacks requirements, rear setback as a standard is 20 feet. This this rear loaded 4 or 20 is an option only when there is this secondary road or access easement on the back. Um, so if we wanted to get rid of that as an option, this would become a mute point because it's going to be a 20 foot rear setback regardless of whether you're front or rear loaded and we just take this away as an option. I, you know, I, I can understand the aesthetic issues and, and parking on the major streets and things like that, but I just wonder if there's a little bit of a different situation, you know, where you've got them kind of backed up to one another and right. only those homeowners are using or accessing that way. I mean, I still think it should be a comfortable, usable distance, but just curious if it's typically the same. Yeah, so typically rear has a little bit more flexibility than the front. Front is what we know is going to be publicly viewed. So in, in our case, 20 is the only answer for front-loaded garage, which is on the next slide that we'll get to in a second. But there is no option. It's 20 period in the story, um, which is, um, as we get to this, the later section, um, if you are rear-loaded, your front setback is 10. If you're front-loaded, your setback is 20. So it all affects each other. <laughs> That's 
So, you know, I, I want to actually address a lot of the mayor's comments because I think she's, she was calling out real life situations that, that bring up the, the need for us doing this right because, because ultimately I, I do feel we have a responsibility for enhancing the quality of life of our, our residents, both, both current as well as, as well as new and existing that would move into future uh, townhomes. And, and I, I feel, to, to paraphrase the, the mayor's real, um, real life examples of just saying that the issue is that some people might put boxes in their, uh, their garage, I think that really downplays it. Because I think I think what it is 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 a fact that we have to understand that that people are going to live in the in the townhomes, and there's a lot of different uh, you know ways that life can adjust what's needed, et cetera. But also examples are brought up that what if what if someone has a third car? What if you know what wasn't brought up? What if they have what if they have a guest that stays with them for a week, a month, whatever whatever it might be? There's there's so many different situations that uh, that really that really create a major risk because again, I think, I think creating a code that we all agree is gonna require enforcement and we all agree is gonna require difficult enforcement is not how we should be setting up our, uh, our development code. We, if, if we acknowledge there's a need, we acknowledge there's, a, uh, there's an issue, then I think we need to address that. And uh, in doing it in a way that's only gonna benefit the individuals that actually move in to these, uh, to these townhomes. So for, for that reason, I, I strongly believe that we need to have that, that minimum of 20 feet. I'm certainly look open to looking at other, other options to, in, to, uh, to improve the code and, and things that might make it you know, easier for the developer, but, but not, not something where it's gonna create such an issue for any cars and trucks that are, that are coming to the townhouse. That's from Zapata. Thank you. So, yeah, we'd also like to add to the mayor real life examples. You know, when your kid turns 16, guess what? Most probably you want to buy a very used, or what they call today, pre owned car. Uh, old, nice, safe car for your kid. So, they use your third car like immediately as soon as your kid turns 16, beside the filling the, the garage with other things and a car. So I think those are real examples, real life, and we have to address a real issue here. So I don't know if we need to start saying, okay, six feet, eight feet will accommodate the real life of people, or uh, is, is a number that we can come out other than four that will make sense, and then just uh, move on, I don't know. Chancellor Bahal. And Lenore, you may be addressing this later. There were some discussions as to um, the property uh, line, whether it in some cases or maybe historically would go out into the street uh, versus where um, it was written. I don't know if that's a Fulton County. Could you speak to that a little bit? Because that was sure. create a lot of confusion on these setbacks and 20 feet, 4 feet. Sure. So the um, there were some difference of opinion, I'll say, with some of the residents we spoke with about the definition of property line and right-of-way line. Um, right-of-way line, by definition, in the UDC is public or private and is owned by the city, county, state, depending on who the jurisdiction is. So, for example, if it's a state road, it'd be GDOT. If it's a city road, it's city of Roswell. That is a definition that's included in the code. Um, so what we've referred to is that the property line front, in, in one case, would be um, contiguous with that roadway, right-of-way line, um, everything that is um, towards the road, sidewalk, curb and gutter, pavement, et cetera, is the city's, and all of our measurements are from that line uh, inward. Um, there are occasions when um, there have been private access roads, and the property line goes to the middle of that, and our access driveways. Um, I believe, again, I'm not, I mean, I don't have it in front of me, so I may be mistaken, but on Harlow, um, my recollection is, is that you have the public right-of-way street that the units are facing, um, the sidewalk, roadway, et cetera, is all inside those lines. It's one foot behind the sidewalk is where the property line slash right-of-way line front <laughs> is. And on the back side, the property lines of each unit come up to each other, and then there is a shared access easement that is granted across all of those units that their driveways are off of. So in those cases, the building setback line would be measured from <coughs> the middle of the property line, but the garage setback is measured from the easement line 
not from that property line. So this covers both of those situations. Hopefully that helps. So any other comments on this screen? Because what, what I think I want to do here, I don't know how this motion is going to turn out. So let's um, keep your notes of what you think a motion might be as we get done. But let's continue to work through this because it, it's going to be a very detailed motion if we get to one today. Uh, so let's then, sure. let's just move Absolutely. on to the next section, and we'll and we'll address any questions you have. But keep in mind what comments you might have as we get ready for some, uh, some kind of a motion. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've been talking about rear loaded, and just to be clear, there is a front loaded section, um, and our recommendation is is that stays the same. I've just made the wording match what all the other one is, and this is still 20 feet. It's 20 feet from the front property line period, end of story, that's the way it is today, and we wouldn't change anything on that. Um, there is this garage doors may uh, constitute no more than 50% of an individual townhouse. This is something that was um, put in the code many, many, many years ago, um, and it basically um, requires there to be single wide garage doors on all townhome units unless they come in for a variance. And that's <coughs> this administrative alternative finding that is at the bottom of the screen. Um, what we've recommended is to clarify this administrative alternative finding is just for this door width. None of the others are staff approvable. Uh, if they wanted to come in and go to BZA for a variance on those other numbers that we've been talking about, that would be that option. And so we've just clarified that the alternative garage door width option is subject to the following. Um, and with our conversations with legal, we recommended adding the word remaining intent, and that basically is they have to meet whatever numbers you guys choose, whether it's the 4 or the 20, whatever those numbers are. Um, in addition, what we haven't talked about is there are some architectural requirements, for example, that the garage door has to be recessed a foot in or have something that sticks out over it. There's some other architectural things that um, DRB or HPC would be looking at. Um, those all still apply, and as long as they're meeting all those other intents and have made an attempt architecturally to break up that larger garage door, um, then there is an option for staff, meaning the zoning director, to make an approval for a wider garage door that exceeds that 50%. Um, as a point of reference, our minimum townhome unit width is 20 feet by code, and most garage doors, a single one, is about 8 feet. Um, our minimum driveway width is 12, which we're gonna, is going to come up as another issue in a minute. So when you go to a double garage door, roughly 16, 17, depends on the manufacturer, but 16 feet, you're immediately over that 50% on our minimum townhome unit. You'd be required to have a 32-foot unit to have a double garage door. Um, so that's why this was added into the code whenever it was. And that's just some clarification that we did on that. Any questions on that? Council Member Judy. So I think I've just been doing some research. I was looking at this stuff last night a little bit. When you increase the driveway length to 20, the reason you're increasing the driveway length most of the time is because you're going to have a two-car garage and two cars there um, to maneuver. So at 20, then you then you got to look at the garage. And the garage is going to, most of the time, be bigger than that. <laughs> That area and that just you're talking about. Be clear that 20 is the length, not right. the width. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I so know what you're talking is about. 12, which I'm going to pop up in just a second to talk about, or 24 is the maximum. Correct. So we have different. No, I, yeah. Books so, that we go to for that. so, so at the end of the day, I think I think that you have to then look at the garage being two car garage if we're going to make the changes to the driveway, and um, for people to be able to grow and do the things that we've talked about here and put stuff in their garage and everything. So um, taking the <laughs> – looking at the garage, I think, is kind of – why? Like, you know, I mean, if you got a two-car garage and you want to take up that space for, for your garage, then you got a garage there. So I, I, and, and just for uh, – I've been looking at Alpharetta stuff. It looks like they're at 18 and 5. So 20 and 4, we were pretty close. Um, so anyway, thank you. Thanks. Any other comments? Uh, Council Member Tyser. So just to be clear, to me, front and rear are, are different situations, and I think uh, ComDev has taken that into account here. Um, is, it, is this a, a one-car or two-car garage, or does it not state that? This is showing a one-car. 
for point of reference. Got it. So if so if a family moved in there with a, a seventeen year old and an eighteen or two children and they became seventeen and eighteen and they bought each a car, then that still wouldn't be wouldn't work, would it? Correct. Because okay. the well, best just, that they could do just is wanna, a tandem. just wanna make just wanna make sure we understand that families come in different you know, different ways and I don't think we can legislate what what it might look like in the in the future. Uh, but again, front and back are significantly, to me, significantly different situations. I, I understand uh, specifically the mayor's comments about sidewalks, et cetera, and, and that, that, that's why the front is different than, than the back. So I, 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 I hear you. Councilor Rahal. Thank you. Um, I just have a question. Uh, are there requirements for additional parking for public parking and how are those measured in some of these developments to accommodate for these this growth and guests uh, and perhaps those need to be addressed as well as society has changed um, we do um, we have requirements in the oh, wait. <laughs> Um, we have requirements in the code for visitor parking for our development. So um, when the UDC was um, done, they put in requirements for visitor parking for developments. Um, and for townhomes, I believe it's a um, 0.5 for, okay, so it's like 1.75. So it's 0.5. So if you do, um, it's 2.25 per unit, so for space. So if you think, I'm sorry, let me get to it. I'll read it. It'll be easier. So you do have, we do have visitor parking requirements that are set for all de, um, developments. Um, not technically for single family subdivisions, but for um, apartments and for townhomes. And somewhere in here is that section. I think it's this way. I think I'm on the wrong way. It's the beginning. Here it is. Okay. So under townhouses, you have um, you have to add 0.5 for guests. So if you have, so it's 1.75 per unit plus 0.5 per unit per guest for a townhouse. So um, and then for multifamily, we have um, depending on the bedroom size, we have specifics for one, like say for um, a one bedroom apartment complex. Let's say everyone has one bedroom. We have one per unit plus 0.2 per unit per guest. So let's say you have, um, I don't know, let's say you have 10 townhouses that you're putting in, then, and each one has 1.75 per unit, and then you have 0.5 for guest. So I don't have And a just to explain that, well, let's assume they've got a one-car garage and a driveway they can park a car in that covers their 1.75 per unit. Yep. And then elsewhere, there is guest parking that has to be provided, whether it's parallel parking, separate parking scattered throughout the yep. development that makes up that 0.5 per unit mm -hmm. in totality. So in the case of the 10 townhouses, they basically suck up the 1.75, so they have the, they need to have five common spaces. Correct. Somewhere else in the development, yes. And that comes in on our plans um, that we review and... Um, so they have to show a separate parking area for that. Yes. So the one and three quarters is for a family of two plus kids. Yes. Right. Yes. I think it's a little outdated. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Henry. Council Member Hall just brought this up, and I was trying not to um, because this goes to scope creep, <laughs> which is I think that our parking requirements for townhomes are antiquated. Um, and one of the issues that, that I've got is that, okay, so the pendulum has swung. <laughs> it was over here, and things like the Roswell Mall that had a sea of parking that never filled up, that we didn't need, the pendulum needed to swing. But with townhomes, what I'm seeing is, and not only do we as good Roswellians um, I'll provide cars to our children. Um, I, you know, I'll tell, I live in a townhouse. I've got two cars. My husband has one. We've got three. Um, but also what I'm seeing is next door to me and up and down Woodstock Road. Okay, let me first say this. Woodstock Road does not allow for golf carts. However, 
if you look at these projects that are going in, they have golf carts. So they're on a road that doesn't allow golf carts. They still have golf carts. They still have cars. And so, like I said, when you buy a new home, townhouse, you're not, that's not something you're thinking about. You're not thinking about at Christmas when grandma comes to visit for two months. You're not thinking of Susie, who's 11 years old, God forbid she'll ever drive. Um, you're not thinking of all of those things. So what we end up with is a situation where people, it, it affects their quality of life. So my question is, can we reach a, an acceptable level that is perhaps greater parking requirements for townhomes, multifamily, and, but not extend it too much to where we have seas of parking. So I think a nudge uh, might be a good idea, but, um, but we're, go we're going back to, and I apologize. I, I apologize to you, Lenore, the last time we went through this, because we started out talking about townhomes, and then I said, what about driveways? Now we're saying, what about parking? So this is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, like I said, I apologize. But Councilmember Hall brought it up first. <laughs> and, and I do think it's a great idea of something that would need to be looked at, but at the at, when the UDC is looked at altogether. Um, I think looking at the industry standards, what has changed, as you said, times have changed, um, and making those updates um, is not something I would recommend singularly picking out just to deal with this. I think we need to focus on these definitions of lots, and we'll figure out that that, that is kind of extracurricular stuff when it comes to the total parking, I think can absolutely be looked at. But I think to focus on what do we want these lots to look like um, from a look and feel perspective and, and contain that first before we start trying to, because I mean, we start talking about build to zone, we start, it, it, it snowballs to the point where we don't have the capacity to be able to do the research that we would want to make sure is done to give you the right answers. Councilmember Tyser. Thank you. Um, in the, in the neighborhood full of fine outstanding Roswell citizens that I live in, one of the design issues that I see as a problem is that there was not enough um, auxiliary parking. And that's what's driven the problem that, that kind of gets described. Uh, I would think that people would much rather park in a full parking spot than hang out into, you know, other areas. And so I think, you know, at the risk of scope creep, <laughs> That is something that, that I think makes a whole lot of sense. It is something that I do see, uh, you know, once, once you've done with that, once you've done with the development, you can't, you can't build any more, you know, shared parking for, for the neighborhood. Um, and so that's, to me, that's a, probably more important than, than wondering whether somebody moves into a townhome with a Prius and a Camry and, and then buys a, a great big van that they have to park in their driveway because their garage isn't big enough. Um, if you had the auxiliary parking, if we had that number better, if we created, you know, enough of it, I think you'd solve your, the rest of your problem. Mayor Henry. And I, I agree with you. Um, it's, it's basically, it boils down to a parking issue. And, and I would like to point out that um, while I applaud um, the development community and um, their desire to make money, their desire is not to create a livable community. Their desire, it frankly, is to create a project that people will purchase and um, that they'll make money. It's, it's called commerce, <laughs> it's bottom line. But what happens is people will move into these complexes or areas or neighborhoods and then it's why did the city allow them to do this this is criminal that city should have never allowed them to do this so I'm just trying to find the fine line between where our development community makes money because that's frankly that's that's what they want to do and I applaud them for it but also create a livable community that um, people aren't looking at us saying, why did you allow this? So 
like I said, I don't know if it's a nudge, a bump, uh, you know, what we need to do, when we need to do it, but I think we need to look at it because ultimately the buck stops here. So. Councilmember Zapata. Thank you, Mike. So, well, I think it's, they're related, but it's two different issues, the side of the, side, the driveway and the number of public parking space required in a specific uh, private development. So it's two different things that they're related to. Um, I think we, hit, we need to tackle both. Uh, I don't know if we need to do one now and then the other one later, but, um, but the size of the driveway matter. Just look human behavior when you go to the supermarket. What are people are fighting for the front parking right next to the door of the supermarket. It's human behavior. So people want to park as close as possible of where they want to go. So it's two different things related but different. So I think that um, we need to address individually each of them, uh, not just take care of one, not the other one. So uh, we can do it in, in, in phases, phase one, this one that have been presented today in front of us, and then phase two, um, the minimum required spaces on a development. But, um, but you know, getting a driveway that you don't feed a, a car and you st start taking part of this, either the sidewalk or the common space or the road or whatever, uh, that is not a, um, a solution. That's a problem. Thank you, Michael. As, as, as we had these meetings um, work, working on this, um, at one point I, I said to Lenore, <laughs> And Jackie, you know, we're, we're in the weeds and we're trying to fit this, you know, we're taking all these terminology and all these words. Why don't we just have a work session, you know, if, if, if the mayor, you know, the mayor's pleasure or some conversation. And let's define the, the project that Roswell residents want. Let, let's look at what the ideal project is, whether it's front loaded or back loaded and uh, what we want, what features we wanted to have. And let's start with that and then adjust all of these parameters so that ultimately the Roswell residents and the developers are clear as to what we want to have in our community and that, that works. So that was just, that, that was where the conversation said maybe we should just have a 90 day moratorium, not forever. Let's define these things and fix this, um, just to just, just the terminology to match that. Councilor Plyman. Thank you. And, well, actually, what I'll point out, so I think this is a very important discussion. Again, you know, as the mayor brought up a lot of real life examples on why this is so important and to ensure that we're, we're setting up the best quality of life for, for these future residents, uh, along with all the current ones. I, so I think this is, this is absolutely crucial. But this actually, I, I want to hear from staff. This was, these were not the item, this was not the item that when you had brought up uh, a moratorium, given all the, the issues that are occurring um, and, and potential issues with, with all the townhomes that you've been seeing, I guess, can you, can you give a high level and address the, uh, the kind of the, the bigger issues on, on why you brought up a moratorium on kind of just the uh, it was just brought up as an option if there's that great of a but, concern. but no I'm saying it was not it this issue. Not, it was the whole thing altogether not this one issue right. it was yeah. the fact that there uh, as we've continued to talk now we're talking about guest parking quantities and this is you know mm -hmm. how many other things this could impact for example if we choose to eliminate the four then there's other sections we haven't even gotten to yet that it impacts those numbers so because of that depending on the consensus we had today would be that recommendation. Um, it, it's not because we're making this change. Frankly, I think that between what we have today and making someone go to BZA and then getting this through the process, if this is what council wants to move forward with, a moratorium isn't necessary. It's a tool to use if we're not comfortable with the answers that you're seeing in front of you today as an option. Councilmember Wilson. You know, I just wanted to, in talking about the parking and the aesthetics and designing good communities, I think that discussion really maybe goes even beyond townhomes. So just, just an example I wanted to bring up is a, a neighborhood that came, that development, residential uh, development being built near my parents. Um, beautiful property. They come, you know, they built some homes, uh, you know, a bunch, a lot of homes, and just the, the way that the homes are designed, um, 
again, the garages are full, the driveways are full. A lot of it, I think, may be having people home during COVID and, and you know, just a whole different situation. I think it's just modern life. Um, but I think, again, situations like that are things that, like I said, this is not in Roswell. There may be some situations like that here. But I think that just adds to the fuel to the argument to, you know, let's look at the at the whole UDC. Um, we're going through the comp plan review right now. There's a lot of major, major changes, um, you know, going through the comp plan. And I think we need to look at the UDC and all the things within it um, and how, you know, how they fit the vision of what we want Roswell to be, rather than kind of pulling things out piecemeal like this. Council Member Judy. I agree with uh, Marie, but we've gone way off track here. Um, I don't think we're far away on this, honestly. Um, I mean, I just did look at Franklin, Tennessee. They're 22 and 5. So we're right in the middle of where, I, oh, you, you mean y'all were spot on. Um, of where we're, what we're looking at here. So I don't think we're way off here. Um, you know, now we're talking moratoriums and parking codes. And uh, so let's keep the eye on the ball and try to get through this. And, you know, if it goes to council and we've got to send it back, so we're not there, then, then great. But I, I don't think we're that far apart here. Um, at least, I don't know, six of us. Um, so, I, I mean, let's, let's try to work on this. Yeah, you know, like I mentioned before, you know, let's put a number and move on. Uh, you know, 620 is a number that everybody feel can support, and then let's move on and have a discussion in mayor and council meeting. But, um, but yeah, I agree with Council Member Judy that we are way going beyond this specific item in front of us today. So. Um, the solution is just to put a number and move on. Councilor Player, I, I agree with that, but I think we're I think we're far apart on the numbers because my my issue is that if we're going to allow the four, then we're just opening ourselves up to just all these all these issues and, and resident frustrations and all that. Where I think I think we need to move forward today with just the twenty foot option, and I'd be supportive of moving that down and creating a what was Franklin five or six six feet. But once once we actually do the update to the overall parking requirement to add more auxiliary parking, which which actually to me sounded like there was full consensus needs to be uh, to be increased. But I'm not comfortable having below a twenty foot option until we've addressed the uh, auxiliary parking thank you any other comments on the front parking front loaded uh, townhomes in this area before we move on all right so the next section is 2.220 and this is the residential parking location um, I rec this is regarding parking in the front setback our recommendation um, is to delete number two and the reason for that is, is that the, this is the 40% that basically no driveway and parking area um, in the front of a unit regardless of whether you're talking about a single family house, this is, this is blanket across all residential units, mm -hmm. um, can exceed the 40% between the front building facade and the property line. Um, the reason we recommend that um, is because we have minimum standards for our driveway widths. Um, it's a minimum of 12 feet um, per our construction specifications and a maximum of 24 for residential driveways. So again, if you have a 20 foot unit and you have one car garage, which is in compliance with the code, their driveway has to go get a variance from BZA because it exceeds the 40% of their front yard. Um, so we recommend removing this and allowing the other sections of the code, whether it's our distances um, between the property line and the, and the front of the building or our driveway standards to dictate what those driveway widths would be. Would be. Um, and of course the impervious area is captured within the stormwater requirements. Um, uh, so that was our recommendation just to make that simpler. Um, and then just to delete the repetitiveness of the garage doors must be 20 feet from the sidewalk um, because the other definitions that you are talking about would establish what that distance would be from the property line. We, uh, that we didn't want to add another distance being measured from a different location to complicate things. Any comments on that section? All right. I think Councilor Zapata had them. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Zapata. No, no problem. Thanks. Um, so, so townhomes are residential, and this is residential. Is this for single-family homes? As well. Addressing okay. that? It addresses that as well, yes, sir. And then if you are on a 
So what would be for a single family home, just to give you an example, North Cross Road uh, from the sidewalk? Uh, That's a different section that we weren't talking about, but okay. it's a, there are, um, front, this front setback would set that. There's other garage requirements, but the, I have to, yeah. So, so this is just redundant so, of other things on the yes. code. Yeah, so make, make it more unclear or interpretation. That is a point. Number three or number, yeah, number three or number it two. It was just an red. additional requirement that regardless of your front setback, you would have to make sure you don't have a car parking in the sidewalk in the public right, you know, backing in the public right of way. Okay, so it's good. all right. Thank you. All right. All right. So the next, I'm just going to go to the first one as an example. Um, essentially, Article 3, 4, 5, and 6 have a residential, uh, have uh, tables specific to townhouse in those four sections. Um, the lot has definitions to it. There's minimums, et cetera. Um, no recommendations for any changes. None of the discussion we've had affects any of these items. Just wanted to give you the, the whole set of, for context. Then there is placement. Um, this is where we've made the recommendation to replace primary street with front to coincide with the definitions we've discussed on the previous slides. Um, and this would be both for principal structures and for accessory structures. Again, no change in the actual dimensions, just making the terminology match each other. And then um, when there is a uh, rear access or uh, right of way access easement and they're being rear loaded, this is where that 420 is repeated to match what's in there in the other section. So it's why we duplicate, I don't know, but we do, so it's all in one place. So whatever decisions are made regarding those numbers would then be reflected here, depending on what is um, chosen by mayor and council. The scale, none of this changes, this is height, uh, et cetera. And then activation, um, this is where the pedestrian access, right now it's required that it face the primary street. Um, this would allow the opportunity for those front doors to face um, the open space. Um, and as a side note, that does comply with International Building Code. International Building Code just says it has to go to a public space. It does not define it needing to go to a roadway. Um, so as long as all the access, ingress, egress meets the International Fire Code and the International Building Code, then this would be um, an allowable um, edit that we would um, recommend. This is carried through on all those other three sections that I mentioned, and I will not go through all those slides just for sake of time. Any comments on three, four, five? All right, let's move on and to last. the last. And the last is just to show you that all those definitions we referred to on the first handful of slides will move from defined terms and not be in both locations. And that is it. Okay. Um, Council Member Hall and then Council Member Palermo. Thank you. I, I have a question going back to the very, very beginning, the 2.2.2, .2 .2, the lot uh, definition. And um, item F talks about the front property line, and, and this is um, for a courtyard or cottage court. So um, if you could clarify for me that if somebody has a cottage court uh, development or project, they would have to identify if they have multiple streets uh, going around it. They would have to identify which is going to be, quote, the front. Correct. They would. Um, the And they have options. They could do it towards the street or they could do it towards the cottage court with this definition as it is today. Um, regardless of any changes that are made, um, both options work um, today, if I said that right. So, um, so that entire cottage court would have to meet what the parameters are, regardless of there being two other uh, contiguous streets that uh, surround that project. I'm not sure I understood that question. Um, so, so my question is, um, could how are you going to orient the homes? Sure, I got you. So, and and, and, let me, and, and, and then do the setbacks because this right. is what creates the setbacks. Correct. So, I think so and it's let very me important. let me correct what I just said. So today, frontage is defined as street or courtyard for a cottage court, but the front property line is defined as the road. So technically, a cottage court, if there are more more than one road, anything that has frontage on a road has to have the front be the road. They can't turn them and face them interior because we don't allow the cottage court to be the front property line in our definitions today. 
it's a little bit confusing. And that's because of the interchangeability of frontage and front property line that has been used historically. When we added the ability for a cottage court to exist, we actually didn't create the correct definitions for front property line to coincide with it, which is what's led to a lot of confusion and a lot of conversations that we, of course, have had. So the new version what we're recommending accounts for that. So in the circumstance where you have a cottage court where that property has one road and the property is off of that one road, then the units that are up on that road and have a line that is contiguous to that road would need to face the road in accordance with the cottage court definitions that are in other sections of the code. The remainder of the units would be able to have their front property line towards that courtyard and then all their measurements would be based off of that definition, whether we define them as front and they'd be required to show that. In the situation where there are two or more streets, then there's options. They can either have them, all the ones that have the contiguous property line with the road can face the road, and then the courtyard becomes their rear activation space, their garages come off of that, et cetera. Um, that flexibility is provided with this. The, um, they could flip them around and have the fronts face into the courtyard. What you then run into is how are those garages, if they're going to do those, addressed. If they are separate accessory structures, um, there, there are some other concerns that might get raised. And I'd, honestly, I'd have to go find every other section of the code where different things are referred to to see if that's allowed. But you could potentially then have a situation where your main roads are all looking at garages as opposed to the fronts of houses, um, and which may not necessarily be what this council would prefer to see. Councilor Employment. That was, I think you were actually reading my mind right there, and it's kind of weird. Um, so that was the exact thing I want to talk about as I'm, as I'm understanding the, um, by, by adding the or civic, civic use. Could... I'm, I'm just trying to think of, so let's use, I'm just trying, I, I like to think of real examples. So let's think of uh, the, the property owned by Mr. Spruill on the corner of Hard Scrabble and is that Chafin? And so uh, the update I brought forward in 2016 doesn't allow townhomes there. So just picture the property, realizing that, that townhomes cannot really go there at the moment under the current UDC. So if, if townhomes were allowed there, and does that mean, does that mean townhomes could be built on Hard Scrabble? And the decision, and the front of the prop, the front of the townhome could be considered the back facing a field. If he just then had half of the the place be just a giant field for the uh, for the residents there, does that mean that 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 the developer could consider the front the front is just facing the field, which is really the back of the property, and therefore on hard scrabble, there would be no requirement for a pedestrian door, and would just purely be nothing but garages along hard scrabble. Yes and no. So if they wanted to have their driveways off of hard scrabble, the answer would be no, I believe. I'd have to defer to transportation to verify this. But those are primary streets, and if your townhome is on a primary street, they have to be reloaded. Okay. Now, a way around that, I'm not sure anybody would recommend doing this, is if they were to shove those lots over and build internal private or public access roads between the hard scrabble and the backs of the buildings, that's a circumstance that's possible. Um, I'm not sure. But if that, if that creates a road, then that's, that's, I think, outside the scope, in which case it would not be using the backs up to, goes to civic, right? Right. Okay. That, right. So therefore, the civic is only making the back the other side if the, if the other side is not a primary road. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. Okay. It would have to be. So, for example, um, one of the ones we've been talking about a lot is how East Village would, is proposed to look. The fronts of those units are towards a gr very broad green space with pedestrian ways, but they have done a what I would refer to as a minor street. It meets public standards. It's a public road. Um, it's not a narrow alley. It's not one way. It's not an access driveway. It's a full-blown 24-foot wide roadway, but the primary road is the road that's going along the sides, and this is a secondary road connecting those two primary roads. So the driveway is being allowed off that road would then comply with transportation's requirements that you're talking about a shorter, low volume, lower speed road as opposed to hard scrabble. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's where those definitions then dictate staff's ability to say, no, I'm sorry, but that doesn't meet this other section. Of the okay. Code. And so actually a question I have for Rob, uh, is there a, is there a clear definition of primary road? 
Is it, is it subjective or is it is it objective? I see this. Okay. I believe it's in there, but is give me one second. Yeah. It's in one of two places, and I, I found it the other day, and I don't remember, so let me just double check. While we're looking for that, Councilmember Judy had a question, and I think Councilmember Wilsey, but we'll go back to you, Councilmember Palermo, when that comes up. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't we just solve all this by allowing the council to decide what is civic, uh, civic use in the, uh, in to back it up, to put where, yeah, you know I mean, because obviously that's a civic use when you have a green space in the middle, so you're allowing the, the um, townhomes to, because it's going to look better and it's going to be better for everybody else. Um, I, I don't know, I think we're trying I, to find I, definitions where there's definitions. And I, I probably don't need that question answered. If I'd support adding that, if we added that council would approve if it's a civic use, then I think that would eliminate the discussion. So to be clear, I'm not referring to civic use yeah. as in the zoning classification. Yeah, I know it. I, I yeah. understand what you're talking and, about. And that definition, we can change those words. The mm -hmm. civic purpose is a, is a open to the public, shared, whether it's... Shared space. Right, shared. right. And so that's why the common open space um, and common area or open space were the two terms that we added because we have minimum requirements for that square footage as a percentage of the total development. Um, and it's a term that we use throughout the document that we could easily refer to. Um, we could change that definition to whatever you guys were comfortable with. Um, this was taking the suggestion from Alpharetta and then making it fit with our code a little bit, a little bit better. Councilman Wilson, did you have a comment while we're waiting for the definition? You know, one of my biggest concerns is just whatever is that the frontage always faces the most public space or the most public view. Um, and, and for us to have the flexibility, perhaps in a situation, hard scrabble, if something came there, to, to maybe make those changes as long as there was good setbacks from the, the street. I guess my, the example that, I, that comes to my mind, I drive by every day. There's two examples, um, Alstead, and, you know, there are townhomes that face the inside. Um, and I know from the way that I read this, if those were built today, the frontage would face Holcomb Bridge, correct? And, and there's another development right beside it at, um, on, on Old Scott where it's a similar situation, that it's homes, um, where they're facing inside, where, you know, to me it would be a much more you know, pleasing view for the entire community if there had been the option for them to face the other way. I just want to make sure we either either that's in the code or it's a flexible. Uh, you're you're correct on the Alstead. It was rezoned prior to the UDC right. and that's the way it was developed. So yes, if it had come through after and the townhomes that face Holcomb Bridge Road would have to face that because that's the major road. And then the smaller street, which well, you look just, at that. to be clear, in those circumstances, I'm pretty sure there is a, a there's a road between. I think there's a road. There's, there's a, a new road. road. Like the, it's the example I just described a minute ago, where they've created a, a roadway that's on the back side of those units between Wilkin Bridge and the interior part of the development. Correct. Which is why the they had, space right, but I mean, if they had had the option to be rear loaded, then the fronts right. could have been facing the Cullen Bridge. You know, they could have a nice yes. sidewalk yeah, in yeah, front but of they them. Are, they're, 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 they are rear loaded. They're, they are facing a street, and then they have another street behind them. I'm pretty sure the ones that, that back up to Holcomb Bridge, right? They they face another road, the main road that comes through. <laughs> I should probably yeah, pull the plot not, up you explain I mean, that. Front, they would be front loaded. They're rear loaded because they face a main street and then they have a drive. They have two roads. There's a road in front and back. So they're rear loaded and their front door is on a street. I know what you're so. talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean, but we didn't have that specifically in the code when that one came through, what we have now. That's where we're playing my job. So I, I have to because it's, I think it's an interesting uh, example. And so, because I think this... Uh, Councilmember Wills is bringing up some good points of really what exists, but also what what we want to see. And it goes back to Councilmember Hall's point that we really should be focusing on what is it that we want to see. So I guess Councilmember Wills, my my question for you is, 
what what do you see as the ignore ignore the current code or anything like that? What do you see as the ideal for Allstead right there on what you'd want to see, and then just wanting to make sure that that nothing's getting in the way of the ideal. I think the way that I read the current code, it's actually taken care of. Well, that would be okay. So the current code, uh, or you know, with with the options that are here. Okay. Gotcha. That's my understanding. I mean, because Jackie said that that wouldn't it wouldn't be designed that way today. Okay, gotcha. Excellent. Rob, do you have information on that street question or, or the yes. nor either one? To Council Member Plummer's question before, anytime there is a question to me on what a definition is, I'm pointing to the UDC and Jackie and Lenore. So if there is a definition for private street, it's going to be in there, and I would defer. Because I guess then using that same hard scrabble example. If, if a developer was there and wanted to just have the back be a field that, that's open to, to all the townhomes right there, what about Chafin? Sha would, would Chafin be able to just have garages all on, all on Chafin? Or, or because would Hard Scrabble be considered a primary road? Or would Chafin also be considered a primary road? From transportation's point of view, and I'm looking at Jackie and Lenore to not disagree with me if I'm saying something wrong, what transportation would have a concern with is a series of many driveways, 10, 20 or more, all closely packed together, all feeding off of hard scrabble or chafing. Gotcha. It wouldn't be the necessarily the garages, it would be that, that long run of driveways yep. that we would have a big problem with. And that, and that makes sense from a transportation standpoint, but then I guess my concern is, as we're focusing on the design, my, my in addition to that, I think that's a legitimate concern, but then separately, my concern with with the ability of just having Chafin be nothing but garages and no pedestrian entrances or anything like that, I don't think is, is really helping the, the character of the, of the neighboring areas. And, and so that's, that's where I want to, because again, the code has a requirement on pedestrian door on the front, on the front entrance, which, which I think is logical. And I want to make sure this definition is not making it easier to get to avoid that. So I don't believe that in the UDC or in the construction standard specifications there is a definition of primary street. There are references to major and minor street, which then refer to transportation's um, transportation master plan, which has the um, map that has the functional classification is identified to it, and that is usually the breakdown that is referred to by transportation staff when they're determining major versus minor. Um, and I think primary street. Um, and secondary street may not necessarily mean major versus minor, it's one versus the other, um, but the, um, the major versus minor is where that definition is going to come, and I, I would defer to them, but I believe Chafin and Card Scrabble are both considered major yeah. in this circumstance. To finish that thought, um, the functional classification map inside our transportation master plan, uh, we use a lot to determine that major versus minor uh, question for us. Uh, major is considered a collector of and above. Minor is considered any local street. So I think in this case it's primary versus secondary, one versus two, not necessarily major versus minor, just to confuse the issue a little bit. All right, so where are we at? So you've seen a lot of information. Um, I think there's some interest that is the same with everybody. I think there was a lot of questions that were answered. Do you need more information, more time to think? Is there a, is there a motion? I'm going to open this up. Councilmember Jeevy. So we went through a lot. Um, <laughs> and me personally, I would like to see this. I, I don't think we're in a rush here. Um, I would like to see it come back to next committee with a final version that we've come through. Um, and two options. I know that we've got the four and the uh, we've got the issue on the f Councilman Palermo doesn't like to put the four. I just looked at Greenville, South Carolina, and they are four and 17. So again, I mean, we're just uh, almost every municipality is about the same. So I mean, I'd be willing to go to five, five and 20 and be okay with it because it looks it's like it's, it's average. So um, you know, I, I would like to see it all in form to then send it to and send it to council. But if others want to go ahead and try to do this at council, then I, I, I prefer if we're going to have a robust conversation like this again at council, where we're you know going through the weeds. I think it needs to come back to committee. But if we're pretty much there and we're good, then 
then I'm fine with it. But I, I, I can't support it without the five um, at the bottom. I, I, I get the 20, but I think it needs to be five and 20, just like the rest of the uh, things, examples I've found today. Okay, Councilor Plamba. And yeah, as, as I mentioned, I, I could support the five, but only when we update the auxiliary parking, because I think we all agreed that was an issue, and, and, that, and that gets down to the issue on why I don't support the five, because I think it's, it's, it's not opening us up for success. So, if, you know, um, so I'd rather do that. Just to clarify, if they did the five or the four, whatever number you pick, they still have to provide the 2.25 parking spaces yeah, per unit, whether that's a two-car garage, Three, they, they, they still are required to comply with those numbers. The part that I think becomes a enforcement issue is that that is assuming that not everybody has a visitor at the same time. Right. Not everybody exceeds right. their own personal parking, which yeah. becomes a private issue <laughs> because those common parking areas are owned and maintained by the HOA. And so there becomes this issue of how do we guess because you're gonna, that pendulum is going to swing the other way when we start looking at this. If we're trying to account for everybody's, assuming everybody's human behavior changes to not parking in the garage and having two kids that are all driving, and we need four parking spaces per unit and make that assumption, now you're going to have potentially twice as many parking spaces as you might need because let's just say that no one moves in there and has more than one car or they walk everywhere. So there, there, there's that fine line of research that really is, is above and beyond, I think, what our capabilities are. Um, but just to be clear, that the parking minimums, regardless of your driveway size, still have to be met. And, and that's, but, so thank you for reminding that, but that's, that's my issue, is that there's the same parking requirement, whether you have five or 20. And so therefore, therefore, if we're doing five, then that's going to put more strain on the parking. And that's where I, it was my understanding this committee kind of all agreed that there were issues with the, uh, the parking requirement not necessarily being high enough. And so that's that's why I'd prefer to see the 20 until we nail down how how we should increase that overall parking requirement. And so the pleasure of the committee is to Councilmember Zapata. Thank you. So a um, couple of things. So I don't know, Michael, if you identify where the sticky points were on all these present big presentation. Uh, I identify one of the main is the 2.219 real loaded uh, on townhouses be one of the main sticky points on discussion here on this committee meeting. I don't know if anybody other identify any other sticky points that we need to focus attention. And then um, if this is the only one and we are talking about between four and six, five, anywhere, anywhere in between, then I think it's ready to move to mayor and council um, and then uh, and if it's deferred I suggest to bring forward the um, auxiliary parking together with this for one discussion on town hall townhouses either on a on a private driveway and on the share or um, public required parking spaces altogether if we defer that and if we are ready to decide between four, five, and six, then we can move it to mayor and council and, and uh, decide on a number between four and six. I, I, uh, I don't know if there's any other sticky point that you identify or anybody wants to point out. And for me, it was this 2.219 real loaded residential garage parking townhouse. Okay, I agree with that. With, if we're ready, we'll move it. If not, we won't. Council Member Judy. Uh, based upon his conversation, I'd say we need to bring it back to committee and try to put the auxiliary parking portion in it and just do it all at once is my opinion. Okay. Um, so I, I would motion to defer to next community development meeting. And, and in the meantime, if staff could, it, it, do you think that's enough time to bring some options on that? Possibly. The only issue is that I'm currently on vacation that week. <laughs> so um, I, I, we, I, I can probably find somebody else who can do it. I don't know. Um, I'll be back from vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Literally back from vacation right there. I, I think we can. Um, the, the issue is, is that there's two weeks that we're both not available um, within that time frame, and so we're, we've only got a couple of weeks to be able to prepare for that. So All you can do is try your best, right? With the, with the parking part, um, I, 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 
I'm not sure how extensive you want our research to be. It'll just be limited based on the amount of time that we have to see what, it, and you're only wanting us to look at the parking for the townhomes, not for everything else. No, right. townhomes. Just townhomes. Okay. Townhomes. So which would be 2.2 something else? The no, it's no. an article. It's an eight. article. Um, eight, right? Eight. No, article 10. Sorry, 10. Okay. So bring article two. 10 together with the 2.219 all together for a discussion. And I said your motion, Councilor Mr. Tyson, I second that. So there's a... Yes, he's Judy. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a motion by Councilor Judy and second by Councilmember Zapata to bring this back to the next Community Development Committee meeting to include in this conversation to talk about auxiliary parking for townhomes. Um, and then so uh, let's make sure the discussion that we had today is considered when you get back next time and just focus on what's left and then whatever auxiliary parking and, and then Lenore if you have any clarification. I did questions. and that was the what this body wants to do regarding the four feet. It's not decided at this point. That'll we be have no further recommendation that we will provide on that other than correct. we can go through and give a list of what everybody else does which. Yeah. Okay. That, that's the discussion I think it's been well I, and I don't mean this I think it's been well discussed so just make sure when we come back that that discussion's already had and you can be thinking about that we'll add in the part about auxiliary parking and then move forward from there I got a motion in a second all in favor excellent so that's unanimous there was a lot of a lot of good information so I appreciate that Mayor Henry I would just like to let everybody know I've got a Board of Commissioners, Fulton County Board of Commissioners meeting at 10 o'clock. Um, so, and it's regarting t -splos. I need to attend that. It's very important. So I'll be leaving in about five minutes. Yes, I was actually going to mention that, that I knew there was a Fulton County meeting coming up. We're going to move forward. I've got to, you know, I'm, I want to try to be respectful of time. Item number five is Councilmember Hall has... Uh, added a consideration to make townhomes conditional use in the commercial corridor zoning districts. Council Mahala, open it up to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this came about just because of the recent discussions and the focus uh, hiring our economic devel development director and the focus on bringing commercial uh, business to Roswell. And as part of this townhouse discussion and, and, and property types, um, I noticed that CC uh, has townhouses as a permitted use, and I um, want to recommend that we make it a conditional use that still allows townhouses in there, but it uh, basically requires uh, this to come to council. And part of this also I, I thought would work nicely is that just in the recent four weeks I've met with several uh, developers and they have really, really appreciated the discussion of um, have the discussion that we've had about what Roswell and the residents want to see and, and they're they're excited to build build projects and bring projects that that would work. Um, they want to partner with us. So I just thought this would be a win win situation to make it conditional. It's an opportunity. It does not stop townhouses from going in these areas, but it gives the opportunity for council to have the discussions and perhaps make a uh, better project than was initially thought for all around. Any discussion on that, uh, Councilman Palermo? So I, I, I agree and appreciate the, uh, the discussion, Councilmember Hall. So uh, CC is a zoning type that's, that's especially common on the east side. And, uh, and, and with that, I, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty clear that, that on, the, uh, on the east side of Roswell, there's a lot of, of focus and interest in creating some, some economic drivers and some destinations and uh, activities, et cetera. And I think, I think it'd be a, a, a great disappointment for many and, and frankly lost opportunity if we had uh, CC properties just becoming 100% townhomes on, on Holcomb Bridge Road without any public discuss discussion and input. Perhaps there's opportunities in, in certain locations where, where that could make sense, but I think it's something that absolutely the public and city council should have the opportunity to weigh in because if we leave this as permitted, then what we're doing is we're, we're opening up that, uh, that on the east side and anywhere where there's a, a, a a, a CC commercial corridor zoning, then then it could just be 100% townhomes without any input or say from from residents 
for city council. So I think this is an important initiative and, and, uh, and, and glad to see it, it, it hopefully moving forward today. Thank you, Councilor Majidi. Yes, um, I have a problem with this going through today to council. Um, this was submitted with no backup, no information, no anything. So I didn't really know, you know, I, obviously the, the consideration to make townhouse conditional use in commercial corridor zoning district is all said. Um, we're here, here again, we're messing with the UDC. Um, we're just, we're changing stuff. Um, and I, uh, I, I don't say I'm against this, but I also think this should have been a discussion today, not an agenda vote to go to council. Um, and discussing this would then allow us to have that conversation moving forward to next committee to put it up, but making a change like this with um, really no backup information or anything, examples, um, and sending it to council uh, is I, I can't support this today. Um, moving forward, I could have a conversation based upon facts and, and what we're doing here. Uh, again, this goes back to UD to, to looking at the whole UDC as a whole, in addition to our comp plan, which is going to come back from the state um, with recommendations on, uh, I, I think probably recommendations on what we need to do as far as housing types. So um, that's where I stand on this. Again, I'm not against this, but I don't think this is uh, ready to go to council. All right, thank you, Mayor Henry. And I apologize again because I'm going to have to leave, so I can't um, stay for the rest of the discussion. So um, what I would... What I would like to say is, um, and it goes to consensus building and making sausage. Um, obviously, this council is not um, prepared or uh, willing to build consensus outside of committee meetings. So that means we make the sausage in committee meetings. And I think that, um, and I don't care either way. We make the sausage. As long as we make the sausage, I'm good. So um, that's what committee meetings are for, to hash out all of the differences, everything that we all are thinking. Um, I would support, like I said, I've got to leave. I would support bringing this back to committee for further discussion. And um, I apologize, I can't be here for the rest of this discussion. But this is what committees are for, to hash things out, to make the sausage. So I would highly suggest that we make the sausage or at least get to a consensus point before we take it into a public meeting. And again, I apologize. Thank you. Um, Councilor Palermo. Excellent. So timing is of the essence of this one because it's it's we're really leaving we're really leaving the the east side and a lot of our a lot of our areas open to uh, to risk because if we if we choose to delay this because in in reality as a reminder of what the process is if it passes today and 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 I, I do want to see a vote today to uh, to move this to council if it passes to move to council then it goes to initiation. And then if council approves that initiation, it goes to planning commission. It comes back for a first reading. It comes back for a second reading. This is a multiple month project. So if we purposely delay this an extra month, we're just now giving, giving really developers an extra month to really build, uh, to build townhomes, 100% townhomes, where, uh, where the residents of East Roswell really want to see destinations and activity. Um, I would like to say, before I have to leave, Council Member Palermo, you just gave the developers an extra month because this was never brought to our attention. This could have been brought to our attention prior to this meeting today. You could have built consensus on this topic prior to this meeting today. So if it was so time sensitive, why didn't you talk with all of us. Because the majority of this council wants to support more townhomes. I want to support okay. destinations. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait a minute. I, I wait just, it's, wait it's a minute. It's, it's clear. We've had this discussion before. Hey, hold on just a minute. Wait just a minute. That's a fact. Those of wait us that don't want 100% townhomes on the east side should vote to move this forward today. It's, it's not rocket science. So is there a motion for this item? Yes, motion to move. Okay. All right. Go ahead and make Councilor Mahal. Well, I... Thank you. Um, I, I put it on this 
I, I brought it for discussion and a vote, so uh, perhaps it just said vote, but that's why I put it on the, this agenda so that we could have a discussion, and that was my intent. I'm sorry I didn't mean to not provide more information, but I just thought we, that's what so it's, so meetings it's listed, are for, is it's for It's listed discussion. in the item as consideration for, which means that that would be for a vote, so we will be taking a vote on this item. And, and, and that's all right. I, I, uh, my presumption was that we would discuss it, have a good discussion about it, and then vote about it, okay, and then vote on it. Councilor so. Zapata. Thank you. No, you don't need to apologize for anything. So, um, so I mean, it's not that complicated. Uh, let's be honest. You either support as a conditional use on a commercial, commercial, commercial corridor, a residential townhouse, uh, or not. I mean, it's simple. Uh, it's not too much. It's a simple sausage. Uh, it's not like a super Italian season sausage. It's a, like a bratwurst. Very simple sausage. So you either believe that the uh, townhouse should be allowed in commercial or should be conditional allowing commercial corridor. That's it, period. I mean, everything else is just that maybe you don't believe, but you believe, or you don't believe, but you want to make believe. So, I mean, it's not very complicated, um, you know. So I think that, um, you know, if we pass this between now and the mayor and council meeting, could be, I don't know, how can you negotiate or anything between, because you either, you either believe on that or you don't believe on that. And you do it or you don't do it. So I don't know where in between can you meet here. Uh, if it's anything that you can meet in between, you have, whatever, two or four weeks between now and the next, uh, bring into the next or the following mayor and council meeting. So for me, it's very simple. Uh, you know, very straightforward, very simple. And uh, if you believe that town hall should be allowed commercial corridor by default, okay, opposed to this. And if you believe it should be a conditional, and up to the mayor and council to allow the town halls in a commercial, commercial, commercial corridor, uh, then, you know, you can make your mind very easy. So um, I think that it's ready to move forward. Okay, Council Member Tyser. A couple of things. Um, I think what Council Member Hall intended was for us to have a discussion and potentially initiate, not take it to an agenda on the on, on the uh, on the. Uh, Mayor and Council meeting. Uh, but I do have one question for Council Member Hall, um, and that is, um, it, 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 my question is, is your intent um, to have only commercial in commercial? Um, would that be what you would be trying to, to, to create here is uh, just, for example, retail? Um, so uh, that would be my question to you, and then uh, just to uh, Council Member Palermo. Uh, this Council Member does not prefer 100% townhouses everywhere, uh, and um, I think your outburst was unacceptable. So it, it just your, the question to you it, it would be very helpful. Thank you, Council Member Judy. And I'll yes. get to that answer in a minute. Um, it's not that simple, and it's not. And it's very simple to have a discussion and prepare other council members and say, "Here's what I'm bringing forward, and here's why I'm bringing it forward. I need support." Um, for me, the statement Councilman Palermo said is completely out of line. Again, I said, "I do not not support this." What I do not support is us coming here today throwing this on the agenda, have a discussion, and throw it to a council meeting. I would like to have a discussion, and I do not support 100% townhomes on the east side. So it, it, don't put words in my mouth yet again. This is nothing but political pandering during an election year to try to get people fired up about nothing. All right? We've had five and a half years to, to and now all of a sudden, this is... An emergency. He's been here five and a half years. So at the end of the day, this can wait for another conversation in committee with the proper demeanor, the proper consensus building, the proper, hey, let's, let's, get, let's get this right. Again, if you would support, let's, do, let's look at the UDC and redo the UDC, we can put stuff where it should be built. And that's what we should be doing, not this, this way. 
Council Member Wilson. Thank you, and thank you for bringing this forward. I, you know, would support conditional use of townhomes in the commercial corridor. I live on the east side. I would never support 100% townhomes on one of those, one of the available commercial corridor property properties. What I would have appreciated is coming to council with a list of the building types that were allowed, what you plan to take out, and for us to have a a a robust, real, honest discussion on what we would like to see and what the community would like to see. Um, you know, that's what I thought the conversation was going to be today. There was no back end to discuss that. And, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned that I wasn't approached other than seeing what was in here as an agenda item, and I was coming here hoping to have a discussion, not having something that's being rushed. Again, I would support the conditional use. I think it might also be used. I, I believe we did add, uh, making townhomes a conditional use in some other districts. Maybe we want to expand that. We should. That's the conversation we should be having today. Councilmember Hall. Thank you, and that's why I put it on the agenda to have this conversation today. It, that's that's what the purpose of this meeting is. Is it not to have a discussion a conversation yeah, to have a conversation and then we decide we decide after the conversation <laughs> what we want to do <laughs> but that's not what you put on the agenda i think you there was a question of maybe whether there was no backup or what the what the item was for is what it sounds like but uh, but it, it we are having the discussion so council member player ma'am so I think I think this is this is crystal clear and as as simple as it gets in the sense that we have we have a use we have allowed uses within different uh, within different zoning types and under CC multifamily is conditional which means if if someone wants to put apartments in uh, in CC which again is mainly on the east side they would have to come to council and residents would get input uh, if instead they want to build townhomes right now. It never comes to council. Residents never get to provide input, and that that what is what makes this urgent. Should this should this council have included CC in making uh, making townhomes conditional there uh, when we when we did it for other things over a year ago? Absolutely, we should have, but nonetheless, we didn't. I appreciate Councilmember Hall bringing this forward. This takes multiple months, and and I feel if if. We do not feel it should be permitted, and if we feel it should be conditional, we need to move it forward right now because the change doesn't go in instantly. Uh, either, either Ms. Dibel or Ms. Bromberg, how long is the process where, if we vote today to get it initiated, when does it actually end? It, October. October. So the so if if we move it today, it moves. It's, it's October. Second, yeah, the second reading. So if we push it back a month, does that mean it wouldn't be until uh, mid? mid-November is when developers could stop doing it automatically permitted. So, so I, th I think that timing is, is very concerning, and I think that's why we absolutely have to move it forward. And, and with that, I think, I think clearly we have some different points of view on it. And um, I'm going to go ahead and just motion to move this to initiation at the, uh, at the next mayor and council meeting. So I have a motion to initiate uh, this item at the next council meeting. Do I have a second? Second. A motion by Councilmember Palermo. I have a second by um, Councilmember Hall. Further discussion? Um, Councilmember Zapata. Thank you, Michael. So, yeah, I guess the last comment from Councilmember Palermo just nailed it down. It's all about it's going to be allowed. It's allowed. It's going to be allowed. But the, the key here that he just nailed it is do you want public input? And mayor and council, who elected officials, input or not, or go just straightforward. So you know that is the point. You want because if you make a conditional use, have to go through public input and mayor and council input and vote. So um, instead of just going fast forward on the process, so I think that that is the, the key. Uh, it's not that it's not going to be allowed at all. No, it's not the proposal of council member Hall at all. I don't read this here. Uh, for me, it's just make it conditional. Uh, and I live in East Roswell as well, in the middle of the mess of the commercial corridor. And I know, you know, I know my community, and I know how they feel about uh, re replacing areas that could be either retail or office, where mix of them, or other destination, commercial destination places, 
versus townhomes. I understand that. You know, I, I come from there. So uh, I think that giving the chance to the people of Roswell, and in, you know, in this case, you know, people on East Roswell who live also in the midst of the co commercial corridor, to have input in the process and have a say in the process uh, is a good thing. Um, so make it more inclusive, make it more uh, transparent, more open, more uh, uh, accountable, and more responsible. So I think that it's a good initiative, and uh, I don't see the complication. I don't want it to make the complication either here. Uh, I see it clearly, and I understand the issue. I live around the issue, and uh, I totally support this motion. So, uh, and I'm going, and I'll call on comments as, as long as you all have comments to make. I just want to be sure these comments continue to stick to are we going to move this item forward or not, or if there's questions on this item. Um, so with that, Councilman Judy. All those points, love it. I want it to be come, come forward and, and be a public process, 100%. Today, no. I, I, we've been attacked by another council member say, putting words in our mouth about stuff. There's been no consensus building on this. I would like to motion after this, if it fails, to go to the next committee meeting to have another discussion on this because I actually think this is somewhere we could have consensus building, but I am not going forward having words put in my mouth and having having things thrown at us and just said, oh, well, you're against this. This is what you want. No, that's not the truth. I'm for everything he said. I'm for a public process. I'm probably for this, but not in this manner. Thank you. Any other comments? So I have a motion to move this item forward to initiate at the next mayor and council meeting by Councilmember Palermo and a second by Councilmember Hall. All in favor? That is Councilmember Palermo, Hall, Wilsey, and Zapata. All opposed? Councilmember Judy and Councilmember Tyser, you? Councilmember Tyser is abstaining. Okay, Tyser is abstaining. So the motion will move forward for initiation at the next council meeting. Item number six, uh, Councilmember Palermo has a consideration to remove requirement within the Uniform Development Code and Design Guidelines Section 4.3.1. Thank you. So for this for this item, it uh, it goes with something that actually uh, this this council ex exclusive of Councilmember Hall. She was not elected yet. This council unanimously supported uh, five to uh, five to zero. Um, I believe back in 2018. And what it what had come about was that's where I was really having concern and issue with with on properties like CX being 100% uh, townhome. And uh, and looking at looking at also having concerns with the fact that uh, within CX it said CX commercial mixed use should be primarily primarily uh, retail slash commercial, and we were seeing that at times that was not how things were being developed. They were developed being developed at, at 96 or 94 percent, as well as I believe some at 100 um, percent residential, and and there was not. There was not a consensus or majority support for uh, bringing forward the changes I offered, but there was a compromise that was uh, that was offered up in the in the public um, council meetings, which which at the time I, I I agreed with the majority of council. I felt it was better than nothing, and I I supported as well. What we had done was we had added a restriction that there needed to be at least two different building types within um, within CX. And, uh, and, and ultimately, since then, this, uh, this council has, has uh, although, although not unanimous, did, did end up supporting that uh, commercial mixed use be at least half uh, commercial slash retail, as well as making townhomes conditional within, within, uh, within commercial mixed use. So because we've passed those, I don't feel it's necessary to have this requirement of the two separate building types, and I would just actually like to remove that requirement. So that I'd like to open up for discussion and, and any questions for uh, for staff as well, and kind of just the, the details of what does that restriction mean, as well as what would it mean to remove that restriction. Councilmember Tyser. Thank you. Um, I think I understand. Reading this paragraph, I wasn't very clear as to what you were trying to do. Um, can you? 
can you give me an indication of if we remove it, what good things happen and what bad things happen? Sure. I'd say by removing it, I think the, the benefit is basically I think the reason it came to a compromise and, and obviously, you know, at, at the dais you would you would um, you would discuss that, perhaps even propose. I, I can't remember, but either way we had we had all voted for it. The 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 main concern at the time was too much residential. It, right, right. So, so removing it, what it what it allows is basically I believe the way it's the way it's it's written now is a single a single use building of commercial would not be available. In which case it creates the opportunity where where a single use commercial building I believe should be permitted to be built without any permissions or variances or anything like that. So that's that's the benefit. And what is the risk of removing it? I see none because again the risk the risk was hundred percent townhomes in CX and we've already we've already addressed that so that's not an issue or a risk in CX. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Would, would, would you all agree with that from Comdev standpoint that it's it's now superflu it's superfluous? Yeah. Councilman yeah. Judy. Uh, I'll likely support this, but this goes back to my UDC thing. Um, again, another issue, another another motion, another put it on, bring it off. So um, okay. at some point we got to address the, the elephant in the room. Right. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion on? I'm sorry, Councilmember Wilson. You know, again, I mean, I, I would support this as well, but I think it's just a matter of process. I mean, if a council member is going to put something on the agenda for discussion, I'd like to see a use table. I'd like to see what that actually means. I'd like to have you come and talk to me about it. Um, you know, again, just consensus building and coming prepared, you know, you know, to make your case and to, and get, to give us an all, all an equal opportunity to weigh in on it. So with, I have. Councilmember Plamo. Thank you. So now, based on Councilmember Wilsey's comment, which, um, for example, the use table is different aspects. Now, is that is that something where I don't have the ability to, you know, pull up? I've got my my uh, my hard copy in there. Is that something where going forward, what I sh what what you'd like to see for this example would have been perhaps if I have staff provide me the exact language in there, so saying, hey, here's staff, show me what is the exact restriction or the exact language. They put it in the agenda, and then basically that way we'd have right in, in front of you, you'd see, oh, here's the language, and then I'd say, hey, staff, red line, red line this line. Here's the restriction I want to cross so out. We can work through that is a little that, bit. Is that what you would prefer yeah, to see? that's what I'd like to see. And typically when I've put items on the agenda for as an item, it has been for us to discuss it and then refer it to staff for yep. further research and for them to report back. This seems to really be circumventing that whole system. And if that's something you're allowed to do, great. But I think we all need to be really clear on what process we're operating under here. Yes. That's where my frustration is. I agree. Sta and, and, hang, hang just a minute. So staff has basically been directed over time that we don't even bring items or talk about items unless we have backup. And if we do have backup, we can't even talk about an item that's not in the backup. I would, I would say that is a standard that works well, um, and we probably need to be reaching that standard for all of the items because I, I can imagine the frustration level if we came in to, uh, if staff came into here and just had an item with the a title and not much else, we, it, that's difficult. And, and so, because I, I, I want to address this, because I think I think what Councilmember Willsey brought up would be more helpful, and I saw Councilman Judy nodding his head yes, agreeing that he would have preferred the exact language in there. So, un Basically, even last year, that was something under under a previous administration. I was not able to get uh, support from staff to include that because this was an item that has not been approved by the committee. That was a change previously when I brought stuff forward in 2016 and 2017. Staff would would add that information, and that was something that was stopped. So if, if we're agreeing that it's that's something simple and quick where I should have had staff provide that, I'll say you're absolutely right, and, and next time I bring anything forward, we'll make sure to have done that. 
Right. Well, I think that's because the process that I have been operating under, if I, if I as a council member had an item to bring to committee, I would bring it to committee, we'd have a discussion about it, and then ask staff to come back with backup. Now, what you've done is completely jumped over that step. I don't, and, I, and I, I, what really bothers me is I don't think any of us would show up for a meeting with a client or our manager or boss without some backup to what we were selling or what we were presenting. But that's what you've done here. I mean, you would not expect them to make a decision without making a compelling case for your argument. And, and again, in 2016 and 2017, when I brought my UDC items, there, staff had always had that clear information so the whole committee could, uh, could see it. But as for bringing it to committee, just to send it back to staff, this item, I think we should urgently remove the restriction, but there's not, I don't see a major risk. Whereas in Councilmember Hall's item, I see a major risk if we had sent that back to, to staff for them to come because that's just giving another month that, uh, that, that townhomes are permitted on, you know, on, the, on the east side. So, so I think it depends on the, on the item from that standpoint. But again, going back to the having staff provide that, that portion of the code to make it more clear, that's something that I can definitely uh, be, doing, be doing next time. And again, is a change of direction than, uh, than it occurred, uh, you know, the last few years. Council Member Zapata. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, you know, again, you know, I don't, I'm not afraid to go item by items on the UDC improvement. So, um, and there's another item here that will suggest an improvement on the UDC and maybe make it more clear, more um, straightforward. So, and in terms of the process, is uh, are we creating the egg and the chicken situation here, and all I'm all for um, you know I'm all for the you know more efficient government and governance. So bring in some items for a discussion, and then see if we get more information. I mean, it's adding more steps and more complication to the decision process and government. So we all criticize sometimes government is so bureaucratic and blah blah. But you know what? We make it bureaucratic. We elected officials make it bureaucratic. So, and I, in this approach, I don't see some issues. Some issues you might need a manual. You might need a manual to back up one page. Some others are very simple, straightforward, that you don't need a manual. So creating a manual for every single item or initiative of any elected official, I think that is inefficient. Um, so, and again, there's always time from committee, if you believe on this, there's always time in between now and then to mayor and council meeting to gather a manual that will back up one page, if it's your any elected official desire. You can always do that. Nobody said you can't do that. But bring in an idea or initiative to then send the staff, so then come back when it's pretty much straightforward, does not require a manual to back up, that is inefficient. Uh, you know, so, uh, so you will have your turn in a minute, so if you let me finish, I will appreciate it and not interrupt Seems and not like be, uh, you know, like don't be interrupting here and being, uh, don't well, be rude. okay, yeah, you're rude, actually, interrupt, yeah, this is the word I was looking for, don't be rude interrupting an elected official, thank you, so, thank you, I appreciate it, so, uh, I think that, again, the process is fine, uh, you know, and it's more straightforward, more direct, and more efficient, so, um, I don't see a problem on, this, on these two items, how the process was conducted and the initiative of two council members. I have no problem, and I understand it. I mean, I understand right here in committee meeting, immediately I read this and I get it. I get it and I'm ready to debate or get a position on this. So uh, I don't want to make it more things, more complicated, more bureaucratic myself. And I think that uh, this is one of the problems that we need to work on straight, you know, eliminate bureaucracy that is not necessary. Do you have a motion for this item? Still have a, yeah, I can, ha still have a, I can have a motion to, uh, you know, if Council Member Bravo who has the need, I can have a motion to approve this. And I'll, I'll second, but definitely want to hear Councilman yeah. Tizer and Councilman Judy's we'll, discussion. We'll get there. I mean, you're just saying you were ready, so I was just yeah. wondering if you have a motion. Yeah, motion to approve these items. So I have a motion to approve, do I have a second? Point of order, we're still discussing it. Well, we will. happened before, too. Second. I have a motion and a second. So is there further discussion? Council Member Tyson. Um, obviously, I'm supportive of 
what you're suggesting here. I just want to make a comment about consensus building. This council did a superb job of consensus building around a major item in our T-SPLOS 2 discussions. We got through a lot, a lot of things without a lot of bureaucracy, without a lot of extra steps, without a lot of the things that Councilman Zapata was just talking about. And that we did that because we all talked about it. And I think one of the things I'd bring up is uh, Councilman Palermo, you called me on a Friday afternoon and we had a discussion about how could we make it come through to, to be the best possible product we, we could have. That's a good example of consensus building. And I think for me, had I had the opportunity to see either one of these and discuss with either one of you uh, a little bit about what your intent was, uh, it would have made this meeting a heck of a lot more efficient because uh, I would have understood uh, what that last paragraph meant. Uh, I would have clearly understood coming in here today that the only thing that number six meant was uh, we were just taking it out because it was superfluous. I would have known that in advance. I probably would have said, hey, let's make a motion right now. Let's get through it. It would have taken a couple of minutes. Instead, we had to go through a definition of what we were doing, and I had to ask a number of questions. So I think consensus building is really important, and it's done um, It's done not just here in this room. Consensus building is done where we, can, where we, where we work to make the best possible product uh, continuously, and, and that's what I would suggest uh, that we do. I know Council Member Hall and I are working on uh, a, a fairly major issue also, and we're trying to come up with a consensus on how to deal with all of that. And I think more than, than should there have been extra detail in here, sure there should have been, but, but either way, had we been able to, to understand a little more about it in advance, when these items come up, it would just be great to talk about them and to talk about them on the phone or talk about them you know, however we, we can so that um, we can be as efficient as possible. Yeah, I'd just like to say that tr transparency is, is, is great when it's needed for certain reasons on some people's part. Other times, let's just get it to council. Let's bring it back. Let's provide as much as possible. I would say this is a transparency issue. All right? People in the public could go on, see what it actually is. And then they might want to be here to witness and then contact council members, et cetera. So, you know, if we're going to talk transparency and we're going to talk process and we're going to talk this, you know, regardless of, I understand council member Palermo's position on what he thought he could not do. Um, moving forward, if we're going to be transparent, then let's be transparent in all ways. Let's not all of a sudden say, well, you know, we don't need anything here. This is clear. Well, it might not be clear to the public. It might not be clear because it's not clear to certain people sitting here at the table. So let's not go down the road of, you know, hey, sometimes let's just, I'm all for getting it through. Now, now let's, let's, let's be transparent if we're going to be transparent. So um, that's my whole point on this. I'm for this. Let's vote. Let's move on. But let's not be transparent when we want to be and not when we, you know, when it's our item. Thank you. Council Member Zapata. There you go. Thank you. So, you know, for what I understand of committee meeting, which is a public meeting, it's a video, it's an audio, couldn't get more transparent discussion couldn't get more transparent than in a public committee meeting. Unfortunately, committee meetings that don't allow public comments, which is, you know, you might agree or not, but it's not the point here, but this is a public meeting. Could not get more transparent to have a discussion in a public meeting. Uh, you know, phone conversations is great, back and forth, but transparency to the max is today. Committee meeting, work session, mayor and council meeting. Could not get more transparent discussion in there. Everything is on record. Everything could be reviewed later on by video, by written transcript, or by audio. So um, I understand why is the accusation of lack of transparency bringing something, anybody, 
any elected officials to bring anything to a discussion or an or vote on a committee <coughs> public record meeting. So I have a motion and a second for this item. Is there any other discussion? All in favor of moving the item forward, raise your hand. And that's unanimous. Item number seven is um, Councilmember Palermo has consideration to create a covert covert work policy. Councilmember Palermo. Excellent. And so based on based on guidance I've received from EPW as well as RDOT, it sounds like that this does not require a vote, but more of just a a policy discussion and just wanting to uh, to make sure that this council is is supportive. And uh, so basically this came about while all of us except for council member hall were on council there was a culvert repair project on pine grove and that's where there were multiple you know committee meetings about it and and then that's where that's where i had i had rose the point that we we needed we need to get sidewalks on pine grove if we're already doing construction there whether we're doing that culvert why aren't we putting up a, a sidewalk around where that culvert's going and at that point found out it was too late in the process and so that was basically the response that we received at committee when i had raised that point point. and so what this what this is is for basically a policy that anytime there's a culvert repair process a, a project on a collector or above which basically means it's on our sidewalk matrix that then staff would would look at what it would take to actually put a sidewalk there as well and just basically come to council for either approval or us to say maybe they come and say you know what it's really complicated it's it's really expensive and this is really urgent we need to get the culvert in in which case council can give approval just to go ahead and not not put a sidewalk there as well so it could go it could go either way but that's basically what this what this uh, policy discussion is and uh, and basically I want to raise to council to see if you feel there's any concerns if anyone on this council feels there should be something uh, that you prefer a resolution and, and voted upon I'm, I'm completely supportive it was based on uh, based on staff's recommendation they felt that was not necessary but again I will I will certainly yield to this uh, committee on whatever your preference is but but I, I guess so my I have two questions for you to and in silence I will assume you're in agreement with me uh, but my two questions are number one do you support the the policy that I'm discussing and the process that I'm discussing and uh, and number two, are you okay with it just being something that we discuss and agree and, and staff follows through on um, because they said they can just have it as their policy or do you prefer we come back next month with a uh, with an actual resolution? Again, I'm, I'm comfortable for whatever this council prefers. Uh, any discussion? Council Member G. Um, you might have said this, so I just want to make sure it's EPW and RDOT. Um, I certainly support this, but are they in support of this? Yes. Yeah, so the the concern the concern I got and Sharon's here. Please share anything else. The concern from EPW was making sure that there's no expectation that this is EPW funds. These would still be sidewalk funds or or up to council to decide where the money comes from. But from that standpoint. Um, it, it was that EPW felt it was pretty easy, in which case why it was really EPW saying not really necessary for us to do a resolution. RDOT, pretty easy from their standpoint because basically the way they come in is basically RDOT's the one that owns that matrix. EPW is not expected to know if Pine Grove is supposed to get a sidewalk or not. That's for, for RDOT. Uh, but, but yes, um, and Sharon, anything you want to add from that discussion we had with, with Dan and RDOT? Um, we actually provided um, in our last committee, item, committee meeting an info item that was the guidance uh, memorandum that uh, Dan and Mohammed and Rob and I put together regarding sidewalks and culvert projects, which hopefully you all had a chance to review. We think that's sufficient to allow us to have a framework to work within when we have a culvert project to evaluate it for the potential for sidewalk and what the uh, construction and cost issues would be and if it's feasible bringing it forward to you for a decision if we're going to include sidewalk in a culvert project. Councilmember Tyser. Thank you. I think that's, I, I would agree. I think that's sufficient. Um, I had a chance to read their, uh, their memo and it gives good guidance. Yep. Excellent. Any other comments? All right. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.